All right, well, as Alyssa introduced me, I am Nick Sorg. I am the owner of Back to Earthworks, and we focus on providing primarily home gardeners, small market gardens with products that help them enhance soil health and speed up that timeline of going from dirt to soil. So agenda, we're gonna talk dirt versus soil, got covered very well already. The soil food web, the pillars of that, and then the relationship between microbes and plants, and then how to nurture your microbes in the soil. So me, I, as I said, I'm the owner of Back to Earthworks, and I graduated from Purdue with a degree in aquatic ecology, more or less. And so I studied the relationships between organisms in the water and their ecosystem. And when I graduated, had the opportunity to start a worm farm, which led me into soil health, right down that rabbit hole. So going from aquatic ecology now to terrestrial ecology in the soil, the soil is an ecosystem and it is our most beautiful one in my opinion. So what's the difference? As he said, soil is alive, dirt is dead. And what constitutes the soil? What is its makeup? Really, primarily, 50% of it is air and water. It's open space. And when you go and walk around or you go in your yards, you know you don't have 50% air and water in there. Um, you're, we're operating in dirt more often than we're operating in soil now, and it's a sad thing. But water and air, very important for the structure and for actual habitat for the microbes to occupy and for roots to have an easy time expanding and traveling and moving through the soil and colonizing it. So the other half of it really, organic matter, and then the things everyone knows, sand, silt, and clay. And that's really the composition of what you want a soil to look like in most circumstances. That photo on the right, that is what was once the Great Plains during the Dust Bowl. Guy's holding his arm up. That's two or three feet of what used to be topsoil. That patch of grass, its roots are what are holding the rest of that soil in place. So it's, <laughs> it's a lot and it takes a long time to make it to that size. Uh, so the soil min minerals, the sand, silt, and the clay, they're all the same thing, they're just different sizes. Your sand is your big, big particles, your silt is your medium size, and your clays are very small. And so the clays, they get compacted very easily. The sand, there's a lot of space between them. You can't store as many nutrients. Water moves through very quickly. Opposite in clay, you can store a lot of nutrients, water moves through it very slowly, air moves through it very slowly, especially when it gets compacted. And you end up with your different silty loam, sandy loam, full sand, uh, clay loam, all of those different things are just different organizations, different ratios of sand, silt, and clay. But they're all made of the same thing. They're minerals. And minerals are just elements, and elements are the nutrients that plants use. A plant gets all except two of its nutrients from the soil. Any guesses on what the two elements plants get not from the soil? Carbon. Oh, I heard one. Carbon? Yep, carbon and the other one's oxygen. Everything else it can get in the soil, it's there. It's just not in a format that it can unlock by itself. That's why it recruits microbiology to unlock the, sand, the, the nutrients locked behind sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. So what is the organic matter? Really, there's, there's three parts to it. And there's, there's the fresh part, there's the spreading of your manure or your leaf litter, year one, the stuff that is fresh, just really went out. Then your active organic matter, the things that are actively breaking down. And then your humus, this is your decomposed part of your organic matter that it's gone through the full process of breaking down and it's what's left over. And that, that humus is, it's your bank account in your soil for your plants. That humus is where they can go and find plant available nutrients. You influence how much water your soil can hold and store, how well you get infiltration, food for microbiology, and habitat for microbiology. And then the final point of it, probably the most important, the actual living organisms themselves. They exist within the organic matter. They actually, a really healthy functional soil food web is supposedly 10 to 15% by weight actual living organisms moving around and operating. So the pore space, the soil structure, this is the big thing. This is, 
life needs to breathe. And it can't breathe if it doesn't have space. If water can't infiltrate, air can't infiltrate, you end up with stagnant patches of water and pool in your soil and air doesn't get into it and then things can go anaerobic and you can end up with disease problems and different, different problems. So no pore space, no party. <laughs> <laughs> and the soil life creates pore space. The plants, the bacteria, the fungi, the earthworms, all of it contribute to creating structure and creating pore space. So the soil food web, this is how energy moves from our sun into our earth and then ultimately to us. Plants absorb that sunlight, they release it down into the soil and exudates, root exudates the sugars, they die and then the microbes, they eat the exudates, they eat the plants after they've died and then the fungi and the bacteria, they're the ones consuming and breaking those things down. The protozoa and the nematodes, they're eating them. And then you have earthworms that eat them. Then you have the moles and the voles that eat the earthworms. And you have the birds that eat the earthworms. And it just, the energy moves all the way up to us. And that's where it starts. It all starts in the soil. So the bacteria, these are the things. We're going we're gonna to talk more about the structure side of it. These are the beginning of building structure in your soil. They take sand, silt, and clay, and they release glues when they're actively feeding and breaking things down that form little small aggregates. They rope together sand, silt, and clay, and they put it into little aggregates. And they're the, they're the organisms in the soil that are breaking down your simple things. So if you put out leaf mulch, you just collect leaves and you put them out, the petals of the leaves or the, the fleshy part of the leaf breaks down a lot faster than that stem, right? You'll end up with stems a lot of times. That stem is a more complex material, and so it's something that fungi primarily focus on breaking down, while the bacteria are breaking down the other part of the leaf that is a lot easier to break down. From a plant standpoint, the bacteria, they form relationships with the plants. They're invested in that plant succeeding because it's absorbing a lot of food from the plant. And so they're friends. And the plant will outsource things to the bacteria. The bacteria want the plant to grow and be successful. So through millions of years of evolution, the bacteria help plants produce growth hormones and regulators and enzymes to help their plant allies. And they're massive living nitrogen banks. They're the most nitrogen dense organism on the planet. And so when a predator eats them, it ends up with all this excess nitrogen it has to get rid of. So the predator poops out that excess nitrogen. And that's one of the main sources that nitrogen or that plants feed on in the soil. That nitrogen source is actually coming from bacteria and the birth and death of the biology. So fungi, these are the World Wide Web. They are, they're interconnecting everything. They're taking those micro aggregates the bacteria make and they're roping them together and corralling them into macro aggregates. And this is opening up that pore space in the soil. This is how we're getting to that 50% pore space. Fungi are big contributors to that. They attack disease-causing organisms, root-feeding nematodes. There's types of fungi that they have little circular noose structures, and when a uh, root-feeding nematode goes into that, they close up, they clamp up, and then they eat that nematode from the inside out. Yeah. So they mediate these plant-to-plant -plant interactions as well. If, if a neighboring plant or a plant in the area is getting attacked by a type of insect, that plant releases a chemical message, and a lot of times it gets facilitated and transferred around into the rest of the area by the fungi. And that message is, hey, I'm getting eaten by this particular insect over here. And those plants say, all right, well, I'll start investing in making a compound that makes me less desirable to be eaten by that insect. And so <laughs> nature has an answer for everything. You just have to put all the pieces in place to let it work and do its thing. I don't know if this video will actually play, but any chance we can try to play this? This is just a short little video. Those are oats on the right, little steel oats and fungi is the yellow dot. 
and it's going to expand out and travel and interact with those oats, and those oats represent nutrients in the soil. When fungi find a, something that needs broken down or a little patch, they go, and when they find it, they utilize their resources as effectively as possible to travel and move it around. Sorry, we didn't re-import it. Okay, that's fine. We don't have Wi-Fi here, so I apologize. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll just talk about this really briefly. The fungi expands out, and it interacts with these oats. And as it finds them, it's like, OK, there's a bunch of nutrients here, but there's no nutrients here. We're going to focus our pathways on developing strong highways to transport the nutrients around this area. And this is a map of Tokyo. Tokyo designed their subway system based off of fungi. <laughs> yes, I wish this video would play. It's very cool. <laughs> Mycorrhizal fungi, they greatly expand your root's capacity, your plant's capacity to go out and collect nutrients. 10 to 1,000 X increase in the ability for the roots to go out and collect nutrients. This root, not sure what plant this is, but this root, you can see where the root is, and then a lot of the rest of this is actually the mycorrhizal uh, fungi network. It's extending the reach of plant roots. So the, the protozoa, these are the predators in the system. They're a main predator in the system. They can eat 10,000 bacteria in a day. And a bacteria is five parts carbon, one part nitrogen. And the protozoa are 30 parts carbon, one part nitrogen. Stay with me here, I'll keep it, I'll keep it simple. <laughs> in order for that protozoa to balance its own body, it needs to eat six bacteria to get 30 carbons. But now it has an extra five nitrogen that it can't use in its body. So it releases it out the backside. And that's what the plants are eating a lot of times. That's where they're getting a lot of that nitrogen. And where are they getting it? When the plants are releasing the sugar exudates into the soil, the populations of microbes right around their roots can sometimes be 50 times higher than the surrounding soil. So if you're a predator, if you're a protozoa that's going out and you're grazing and you're eating microbes, where do you want to hunt? Where your prey is most abundant. Mm -hmm. And the plants know this. And so they're, the plants are basically farming microorganisms. The predators are attracted right next to their roots where they eat and release nutrients. And his soil, 96, 97,000. Uh, protozoa, a single gram of soil can have 50,000 of those protozoa, and each of them are eating 10,000 bacteria in a day. So that's a lot, you could think about, that scales up pretty quick how much nitrogen can get released in a healthy, functioning soil. The nematodes, there's a lot of different types of these, we don't have to go very deep into them, but they, they eat bacteria, they eat fungi, they'll eat roots sometimes, and they'll eat other nematodes. And their carbon to nitrogen ratio is 100 to 1. So every time they're going out and eating stuff, they have to release a lot of excess nitrogen as well. Plants utilize that. <laughs> so sunlight comes in, plants take CO2, they take water, they combine it all into sugars, all right? And what do they do with a lot of these sugars? Well, they release them out of the soil. And they don't just release one type of sugar, and this is where it comes to plant diversity is very important too, because the more diversity of plants you have, the more diversity of sugars you have being released into the soil, which means the more diversity of life in your soil, which means more resiliency in your ecosystem. If you have a particular pest species that breaks out, you want to have the tools on your farm, you wanna have the organisms that handle that and take care of that. So as that problem, per gets a little bit worse, the population of the predators that take care of it and the other inhibitors that are part of that system, if they're there, they will grow to try to deal with that issue and keep it as minimal as possible for you. Sometimes you do have to use other interventions, obviously, but you want to put all the pieces in place, and plants do it. They know how to do it. They've been doing it for hundreds of millions of years. Just let them do it. We just gotta enable them to do this. So with this, how do we actually feed the biology in the soil? Well, 
you want to avoid synthetic fertilizers at all costs if you really can because all they are are salts and salts kill the biology. It's like us, if we drink salt water from the ocean, it's going to kill us eventually because we can't handle all that salt. And the microbes are the same, but they're just more susceptible to it. So use chemicals as a last resort if you have to, but fix the system first. Like life needs food, water, shelter. It's what we all need, it's what the microbes need, and the plants are a big part of providing that to them. But we can, we can boost the system and move it up. So maybe some of these organic inputs that can go out into your soil and into your garden, your farm, the organic matter like the horse manure, if you have access to that, great. That's a good thing to bring in. Microbes will eat that, they'll break it down, they'll make it available to your plants and you're adding that structure. Fish hydrolysate, fish emulsions, those are excellent things to use. That is how the Pacific Northwest gets fertilized is through salmon, it's through fish going out into the forest. There's actually, they've done studies about where the nitrogen in the leaves of some of these trees in the Pacific Northwest come from. 80% of the nitrogen in some of these leaves and trees are traced directly back to salmon and fish that have been put there through the salmon runs and the bears, the eagles, all the wildlife dragging the fish up into the forest and then it breaking down and getting recycled into these leaves. So fish hydrolysate, fish emulsions, that will directly feed your plants, but it also feeds your soil and the biology. It's a great thing. Molasses, that's a great thing as well. Uh, it's basically like a root exudate, but just a simple one. And uh, the bacteria love to feed on that. Humic acid, that's another great thing to put out there. Kelp extract, and then uh, Green Guardian, that's one of the products that we have and we sell. It's a biostimulant. It's a whole range and mix of these things that you can spray on your plant and spray in the soil. And it feeds the biology in the soil and improves those plants' uh, immune systems. So, and then from the shelter standpoint, organic matter is shelter for microbes. Biochar is one of my favorites because it persists and exists in the soil for a very long period of time, decades to centuries. When you put it out, it's there doing work year over year over year. It's providing a bunch of surface area for those microorganisms to colonize and grow. You could almost think about a, like a city. When you have a high rise skyscraper, you can fit a lot of people into that small area compared to a suburb where people are very spread out. So in the soil, we want to build our micro populations. And so the more we can increase our soil's ability to house them, the better off we are. So biochar is a great way to do that. It has a lot of uh, shelter spaces in a very small area, and it enables you to store more plant available nutrients right there in your soil and bring some structure in at the same time.